All right. We are live. We have with us Alexander Merkurs and the one and only Professor Jeffrey Sachs. I have all of your information in the description box down below, and I will add it as a pinned comment so you can uh, read all of, uh, of uh, Jeffrey Sachs' articles and his analysis and uh, everything that he's putting out there. It is fantastic. And thank you to everybody that is watching us. Thank you to our moderators, Alexander. Professor Sachs, we have got quite a lot to talk about, so let's let's get into it. Indeed, yes. I mean, uh, let's go straight in because I we we want to discover to discuss rather two topics today. One is a in, very important article which you've written about the evolution of the financial system in the world, but I think we must start with the events in the Middle East, in Israel, in the Palestinian territories, in Gaza, and. Um, to most of us, this has come, it seems, out of a clear blue sky in the sense that we've always known that there were problems there, many, many very deep-seated, serious problems. But I certainly wasn't expecting that just over the last couple of days, the events would take this dramatic turn that they have. And um, I was wondering, Professor Sachs, I mean, you know the region, <laughs> you know every region, but you know this region. Um, what are your initial thoughts? I mean, where are we heading? Oh, it looks as if, thank heavens, there is now an effort to try and avoid an expansion of the war. We're seeing the Israeli government and the US government saying there's no evidence yet that Iran was involved. But the events that we've just seen, they do, to my mind, illustrate another point, which is that this underlying conflict in Israel, between Israel and the Palestinians, remains unresolved and um, continues to be incredibly dangerous. And there still seems to me to be a failure of diplomacy there to try to resolve it. You know, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, Antonio Guterres, said, said it right, that uh, at the core of this uh, further disaster in the world and this uh, profound uh, catastrophe and, and destabilization is uh, 56 years of uh, Israeli occupation uh, after the Six-Day War uh, of uh, Palestine, the failure to get a two-state solution for decades, uh, despite uh, many UN Security Council resolutions, and of course, uh, uh, a complete breakdown of uh, that process uh, in the most recent uh, government of uh, Netanyahu. I don't think anyone could have predicted uh, exactly these events, though, uh, as you pointed out, uh, very rightly, your uh, recent uh, discussion of this, um, the UN special envoy for the region said this is a boiling a cauldron. There's growing violence. Uh, there is uh, unrest. There is seething discontent. That was a year ago. Uh, and the past year has been uh, a year of turmoil inside Israel because Israel is profoundly divided as a society and as a polity. Um, so it's not as if Jake Sullivan was even remotely reflecting reality when he said a couple of weeks ago that the Middle East is uh, the quietest uh, in two decades. That shows uh, the unreality of American policy thinking. Uh, and it seems likely, though everything, uh, as you very well know, is unconfirmed right now, that uh, it wasn't, and you again pointed this out very rightly, most likely a, a failure of intelligence as it was a failure of processing mm -hmm. information by the political leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. Egypt uh, has said, uh, Egyptian government uh, spokesmen have said that they warned Israel uh, 10 days ago. We don't know whether this is uh, actually uh, exactly right, but that they warned that something big is uh, about to happen. And what I think we can see is pretty clearly a failure of the political class for sure. We don't know whether it was a failure of intelligence gathering, a failure of information, but it was a catastrophic failure 
of the political class, both in the short term to understand current realities and in the longer term, because the whole approach of Israel is to believe uh, that the Palestinian issue can be ignored forever, basically. That's the real uh, 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 tactic of Israel, which is this will go away. We will make peace with the, the rest of the region for whatever pragmatic reasons. The Palestinian issue is is gone. We control uh, the territory of uh, Israel and the West Bank and Gaza, and uh, we don't have to deal with this uh, underlying 56-year uh, issue since uh, the 1967 war. So I keep coming back to von Clausewitz uh, on all of the issues that uh, you are dealing with and that we're discussing. These wars are the continuation uh, of politics with other means. Mm -hmm. We're talking about politics here and we're seeing in Ukraine or in uh, this uh, disaster uh, in uh, Israel and the unfolding uh, humanitarian catastrophe uh, as uh, Gaza is now bombed with vengeance uh, and besieged, we're seeing a complete failure of politics to address underlying issues. And uh, war never solves the political issues by themselves. And von Clausewitz, by saying this, I think as all scholars uh, know and should understand, he wasn't saying that war is a substitute for politics. He says war is a continuation with other means, but diplomacy is supposed to go along with this. And if you take the view that you don't really ever need to solve the politics because military power will do it for you, that's never true. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we're seeing yet another catastrophic demonstration of this in uh, in Israel. I think that is absolutely correct. And can I just say, it is not just the Israeli uh, government, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, that has basically turned its back on diplomacy, it seems to me, in attempting to find a solution to this issue of the Palestinian territories and of the Palestinians and their position in uh, the Middle East and in the world, but also that of Western governments. I mean, for as long as I can remember, for decade after decade, there were attempts by US officials, US diplomats, US secretaries of state, Henry Kissinger, whoever, all trying to find some kind of negotiated solution that would address this problem. And one of the things that has really changed and is very alarming is that at some point over the last eight, ten years, people seem to give up. Nobody, nobody's been trying to do anything like this. I don't know, for example, whether the current administration even has a Middle East envoy. Just, just, just saying. I mean, there always used to be one. There always used to be someone that both sides would talk to and try and exchange ideas. And of course, one can argue that that diplomacy wasn't getting us very far. It wasn't solving the problems in any meaningful way, but at least it did provide an opportunity for people to talk and discuss and meet and speak and uh, uh, come to some kind of even minor agreements which sort of diffused the situation. And that's, as far as I can see, that's all been abandoned entirely. The Biden administration didn't do it. The Trump administration didn't do it. Obama did to some extent, but not very successfully. And since he left, well, I haven't seen anything. I think the, uh, the, the uh, fact uh, of the Biden administration certainly very explicitly was uh, the Palestinian issue is not an issue. Uh, what we are working on is a, is a, and run around that, uh, a, uh, their hope was for an Israel-Saudi uh, agreement on pragmatic grounds uh, by uh, both sides that completely ignored uh, the Palestinian issue. It always seemed uh, extraordinarily doubtful to me that uh, that was real. It just seemed like another figment in the imagination of uh, this administration, which has many 
of them. But that was explicitly the idea, which is we don't have to take uh, the issue of Palestine. The truth is, you know, we're in almost 100 years now, not just uh, the 56 years since the Six Day War, almost 100 years discussing the issue of how uh, uh, Jews and Arabs, are, uh, Muslim Arabs in particular, are to live together in this place. And it remains not only unresolved, I would say for decades, uh, the Israeli approach was we don't really need a solution to this. We need to make facts on the ground. Uh, and uh, as far back as I know from direct observation, Israel was putting uh, what has now become hundreds of thousands of settlers into what would be uh, the Palestine uh, independent state if there were a two-state solution. And the idea was to frustrate uh, the two-state solution, that there could not really be a two-state solution despite the words that were constantly used to that effect. So I don't think that the American presidents ever seriously took that on. And I don't think any Israeli government, except for one, uh, except for Yitzhak Rabin, took that on. And he was assassinated uh, in trying to make peace. And that's another major lesson in the world. It's much easier to derange peace than to make it because those who oppose peace kill those who want peace. This is uh, uh, actually, uh, unfortunately, throughout history, a pretty widely observed phenomenon. So most of the Israeli governments didn't really try or they put on the table a an offer that they knew uh, would be refused because it basically was not really a two-state solution. Uh, Gaza is a tragedy that is now, you know, reached both uh, this uh, uh, horrific, uh, 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 horrific uh, destruction of uh, of innocent people uh, in Israel, and now it's going to suffer vengeance from the air with probably thousands and thousands of uh, innocent. Uh, Gaza residents being killed in the next few days would be my guess, because I'm not sure that this uh, Netanyahu government has any restraint at all right now, any self-restraint. Uh, so we may see a absolute uh, horrific humanitarian uh, I mean, deliberate catastrophe in response as vengeance. Uh, that would not surprise me. And it would be just a, another round of uh, destruction and another poisoning for years to come. And we watch in the U.S. Uh, politics, you know, the American politicians are also, almost none has really been able, even if they wanted to, to approach this issue. It's, uh, America's not an honest broker in this and never has been. Uh, American politics is so geared to backing Israel rhetorically, symbolically, mm -hmm. unconditionally, uh, that uh, there is no, uh, with the rarest of exceptions, uh, a, an honest proposal put on the table. Mm -hmm. And so we're trapped in this spiral of tragedy. And uh, I don't see anything in the, in, in the outcome of this that's going to relieve that or make people wake up to reality or, you know, these events... Uh, are not conducive to rational responses. Uh, they are conducive to disastrous mm -hmm. responses, just like 9-11 led to 20 years of US foreign policy disaster uh, in everything misconceived in response. Uh, Israel is likely to create uh, grave, uh, disastrous responses uh, to these events. That is exactly my thought. And I have to say, Prime Minister Netanyahu talking about 9-11, this being Israel's 9-11. I mean, it is a, I would have thought that given how unsuccessful ultimately the U.S. response was to that, that would have been a parallel which an Israeli prime minister would 
want to avoid. And it's, it is so right, by the way. You know, the, the response was precisely, precisely to say there's no such thing as politics. There's only war. So the response to 9-11 was to launch the uh, GWAT, the Global War on Terror, which logically made not an iota of sense from the beginning. How do you launch a war on terror? Uh, that's to deny politics. Uh, that's precisely what it was. It, it's to deny any underlying conditions that give rise to terror, for example. Uh, and so it was a denial of politics. Of course, it led to Afghanistan. It led to Iraq. It led to Syria. It led to Libya. And in its way, it led to Ukraine because everything was, we don't need any diplomacy. We need power. And uh, for Netanyahu to repeat it in those terms and to then hear what we've heard, which is uh, we're going to besiege uh, Gaza with no food, no water, no power. Uh, it, it's uh, If it's meant, and it may well be meant, it is... Uh, exactly the post 9-11 disaster that the U.S. faced mm -hmm. continued now. Absolutely. Professor Sachs, uh, we could discuss this for many hours, but I, I think I would like to move on to this other topic, which is the one that you've written a brilliant article about, about the changes in the world financial system, about the position of the dollar. It's a topic that has been much talked about. Many people um, would like to know more about this. I would certainly like to know a bit more. And you've written a wonderful article about this issue. Perhaps you can tell us some of the salient points in that article, the kind of things that you want to, um, you know, people, you feel that people should be aware of. Well, I, I think uh, the, the main starting point uh, about any discussion about the dollar is, should be the pound. <laughs> and just to put it this way, uh, a hundred years ago, anything we say about the dollar today, we said about the pound at the time, mm -hmm. uh, that the British pound was the center of the world financial system, the center of world currency, uh, the way you made payments, and so forth. Now, uh, of course, uh, there still is a, a, a city of London, a financial center, and a very talented one, in, in fact, but the pound plays no role. Uh, at all in international affairs uh, to speak of, uh, other than as a historic uh, uh, relic. Um, and the, the, the reason is, of course, the fundamental uh, change of uh, power. There's uh, no British Empire anymore, and uh, there's Britain, and there's still the pound, but uh, Britain's role in the world is fundamentally different from what it was 100 years ago. And it reminds us of a basic point. Uh, one can, money is a way to make the real economy, the economy of goods and services operate. It's a way to make exchange, uh, to make trade. But whether you trade in dollars or pounds or renminbi or euros or rupees or rubles, is not the most significant thing in the world. Indeed, when you study monetary economics, as I did, and as I taught for a couple of decades uh, at Harvard, you actually use an expression, money is a veil, uh, a veil to the real economy. Uh, the real economy is the action. Who produces the chips? Who produces uh, the, the microchips, the potato chips? How do you trade and so forth? And how you settle that in monetary terms, that's not so complicated, not such a, a big deal. And I was involved a couple of times in helping countries adopt a new currency from one day to the next. Uh, I, in Estonia and in Slovenia in the early 1990s, I helped them uh, make a, a new currency instead of a ruble to use the kroon in Estonia, invented from one weekend to the next. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, in uh, in Slovenia, the tolar basically invented uh, from the Yugoslav currency. And the point is, yeah, it's not so hard to 
uh, change the currency of denomination and the mechanisms. Now, having said that, the dollar has been the currency of choice for denominating international transactions and for settling international transactions basically since the end of World War II with many evolutionary changes along the way. But it's been convenient to have a unit of account uh, that is shared as long as the dollar is managed uh, as a money in a responsible way by the United States. Now, that has been sometimes true, sometimes not true, but the dollar has uh, held up as a predominant but not the sole currency of choice for uh, decades. The big changes that are going to end that within 10 years, in my opinion, much faster than my colleagues think, by the way, because they say, oh, the dollar will remain predominant for decades to come, and I think this is not true, is two things. One, one of the reasons for the dollar predominance has been the convenience of the dollar-based banking system. So it's been a fairly efficient, low-cost way to make transactions. Uh, in international life, whether it's offshore dollars or onshore dollars, the U.S. banking system has been a, a mechanism for settlements. Uh, and uh, the big number one change in the world is we've got new technologies for settlements, especially digital technologies, and we're going to have digital central bank currencies. So we won't even use banks for a lot of our payments in the future. And without the banks, the advantage of the dollar as a payments mechanism, purely mechanistically, will diminish considerably. Second factor, actually three, I should say. Second factor, of course, is the decline of the relative share of the US in the world economy, uh, which is ultimately what undermined the role of the pound sterling. Uh, it's been more gradual, but it's absolutely sure that the U.S. diminishes as a share of the world economy. Depending on how you measure it, you get different metrics, but arguably China is a larger economy than the U.S. now if measured at what we call purchasing power adjusted prices. And in any event, the role of the dollar, no matter how you measure it, or the share of the U.S., I should say, in the world economy, no matter how you measure it in the various ways is diminishing and will continue to diminish. Mm. Then the third factor is the big mistake of U.S. policymaking, other, mm. in addition to various disastrous blunders of monetary policy, the worst of which was September 14, 2008, when uh, the worst policy decision in modern times was made by one of our worst treasury secretaries, uh, Hank Paulson, when he deliberately bankrupted uh, Lehman Brothers and put the whole world into a catastrophic financial panic. But I'll put aside that. The, the deliberate choice was to weaponize the dollar repeatedly in the last 20 years. The U.S. said, oh, everybody uses the dollar. Well, we can then intervene to stop Iran or to stop Venezuela, or to stop Russia, or to stop other countries we don't like mm -hmm. from doing whatever it is we don't want them to do. So the weaponization of the dollar has meant uh, the U.S. confiscating the foreign reserves of many countries now, Russia being uh, the, uh, the, the biggest of all, of course, with an estimated $300 billion of Russian money frozen, because the U.S. signed a, 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 a pen, the president signed a pen saying that U.S. banks could not transact with Russia. And, uh, well, why the heck would Russia continue to use dollars afterwards? The U.S. idea was uh, completely wrong, which is, well, this is the, as was said, the nuclear weapon of financial policy. Mm -hmm. It proved to be nothing because mm -hmm. it's not so hard to transact in other ways. The idea that the, the payment currency 
is somehow the definitive power over the real economy is a deep conceptual mistake. So mm -hmm. Russia started settling in renminbi or in rubles or in rupees. And um, it's now going to accelerate that process mm -hmm. because at the core of the BRICS 11 now mm -hmm. is the original BRICS five countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Mm -hmm. Conveniently, they all have currencies that start with the letter R. <laughs> this is very nice. Uh, it's not fundamentally important, but it's not bad that you have uh, the real, the ruble, uh, the rupee, uh, the renminbi, and the rand, because now they call it the R5. Uh, and they're working this year in advance of next year's BRICS summit in Kazan, Russia, uh, which will include 11 countries, the original five plus uh, Argentina, uh, 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 Egypt, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. the Emirates, and Iran. They're going to come up with new payments systems mm -hmm. and new units of account, maybe an R5, uh, like a special drawing rights, which is technically a way for bank for central banks to borrow and lend from each other. It's nothing more than that. It's not, no magic. It's just a, mm -hmm. a right to borrow from a counterpart central bank. Uh, and the BRICS can make their own SDR, uh, if you will. They can mm -hmm. make their own unit of account by a basket of currencies. They can decide to settle and have uh, credit card systems uh, clear uh, within uh, the, the BRICS region. And they're going to succeed in this because it's not magic uh, and it's not uh, some uh, unimaginably complex maneuver. It's pretty standard financial engineering mm. and they will succeed uh, in, uh, in doing that. Mm. I think this is the point about it, not that not being any magic behind it is, is the key thing because in the West, in London, I spent, spoken to many, many people who assume that we have knowledge and expertise and tech skills which simply cannot be found in other places. I mean, I, I, I've had some dealings in maritime insurance in the past. And I remember people telling me when the all cap idea came up, you know, they can't copy this. If they can't get insurance in London, the ships will have to stop. So they will sort out their insurance systems beyond the no doubt about it. Maybe in the 60s it was different, but today it's not difficult. They can do this in India. They can do this in Shanghai. They can do this in Dubai. They can do it in Russia. They can do it. And I think that the point you make about the ability to set up currencies, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Keynes actually did this during the Russian Civil War in northern Russia as well. And he was actually very successful. And he already showed as far back as then how it could be done. Am I? And again, just quickly, very quickly, because we're coming up to time. But am I right in thinking that what the BRICS are talking about also resembles closely some of the ideas that Keynes had? in advance of Bretton Woods. <laughs> yeah, K Keynes, by the way, you know, was a, a, a genius in monetary economics and uh, yeah. at least as interesting, if not more interesting than the general theory is his writings about monetary policy in the 1920s. And I was a student of uh, all of that myself. Uh, and uh, Keynes mm -hmm. has been a big inspiration for me in a number of ways of his uh, political economy. But I can tell you, in, in my experience in Estonia in uh, 1991, it was literally one evening conversation uh, with the governor of the what would be the new central bank of Estonia, what to do. And they implemented it <laughs> within uh, basically a, a few weeks. And they went on to have a, a currency that was stable against the mark uh, and then stable against the euro. And it took about a month. Uh, to put together. And that was in the midst of the turmoil of the breakup of the Soviet Union. So this is not magic. Uh, and uh, of course, it's nice to have financial expertise, but there's a lot of financial expertise uh, all over the world right now. 
and uh, the financial expertise in London can help with settlements in other currencies or make uh, insurance policies in, in other currencies. And they're going to have to do that, actually. So this is going to change, in my view, much faster. And it's because if you push hard on what de Gaulle called America's exorbitant privilege, that privilege is real to have other countries use your currency. But if you lean too hard on it, the privilege goes away because no one wants to pay an exorbitant price for America to be able to use its use the dollar to determine geopolitics. No one's going to allow that to happen. Professor Sachs, I just wanted to quickly make one final point which you may or may not agree with me about which is that of course for us in britain you mentioned the pound sterling when our empire went we found the fact that our currency had become a reserve currency it, it ceased to be an asset it became a burden in many Absolutely. ways and Others were trying to cash in on it you had to mm -hmm. freeze their accounts <laughs> Exactly. I mean, it was anyway, Professor Sachs, uh, this is where I, I mean, we, we're up to 30 minutes, which is what we said. Again, an enormously stimulating program. We could discuss these things for hours. We probably will. In the I hope future. so. Great. But um, I, I, I will stick. I Let's will do stick. one question, which is directed towards you, Professor Sachs, sure. specifically, and then Alexander will answer the rest of, uh, of yeah. the questions. To the uh, from yeah. From Tommy Gunn. Professor Sachs, how will sustainable development goals fare in light of the Russian Black Sea blockade? Will the Russian concessional prices and exports make up for the disruption? Look, the, the basic point is sustainable development uh, cannot work in the context of war, period. So it's not specifically about the Black Sea or whether there's a grain deal or not. To achieve Anything that we want to achieve on the planet, the United States and Russia and China need to cooperate with each other. Uh, we are not going to succeed in any of our objectives in a deeply divided world, much less a world in open war. So it's not technical issues that uh, block us. It is, it is uh, the cooperation of major powers in the world to create a framework in which people can live their lives uh, and have uh, normal progress and their kids can be in school uh, and uh, not uh, in the disasters of war. That's what good politics is about. Geopolitics needs to be not about who's number one, which is a crazy idea in this world, uh, it needs to be about how are we going to get along peacefully. That's diplomacy. The generals need to sit down, get back, and we actually need diplomats. Unfortunately, our diplomats became the greatest cheerleaders of war in the last couple of years. We don't even have diplomats that I see right now because uh, all they talk about is weapons and war. We need real diplomats in the sense of making cooperation work and because it's it goes much beyond a grain deal or the specifics of what's going to happen in the next six months the sustainable development goals are about long-term investments in education in skills in physical infrastructure uh, in the way we live our lives and that requires a vision of peace and it requires actual financial cooperation joint projects. Uh, just to give another example, in a, in a few days, China will have the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative was China's offer of uh, giving long-term lending to help countries build infrastructure. It's actually a terrific program. It should be praised widely and those of us outside should be saying, we want to partner with you. You want to build high-speed rail up to Samarkand? We'll help build it from Samarkand to, to Paris. Uh, and uh, it, in other words, this is an offer for cooperation. Instead, of course, the United States badmouths it every single moment it possibly can. You know, horrible. Uh, we want to, we don't want to connect with you. We want to build our alternative. Not that necessarily they ever will. So. The issue 
is really a, a deeper and, and in a way a more abstract one. If we are getting along, not literally uh, at war with each other or threatening even more disastrous wars, we can achieve everything we want. And if we're at war, believe me, no one spends a minute thinking about sustainable development in the middle of a war. And uh, if your main goal is to boost the ammunition or to bomb someone or to create a new alliance, you're not thinking about sustainable development. So it's not about the specific deal uh, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, the Black Sea. It is about peace in Ukraine. And that requires U.S.-Russia negotiations directly. Because this is a war between the United States and Russia over NATO, over the security arrangements of Europe. And if we are civilized and smart, this war can end basically immediately by having a security arrangement that makes sense in Europe for everybody, including for Russia, uh, for Ukraine, for others. And that's what we have refused to talk about for three decades now. And that's our biggest. So it's just like when we started talking about uh, Israel and Palestine. That's been almost 100 years without a serious discussion. And in terms of European security arrangements, it's been 30 years without a serious discussion because the United States said, well, our answer is NATO. And that's not an answer that works for European security because it doesn't work for Russia and for many other countries. And so this is the core of the issue of peace, and peace is the core of the issue for sustainable development. Absolutely. Fantastic. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, we have all of your information in the description box down below. We will have it as a pinned comment. Thank you very, very much. Great. See you guys soon. Take care. Take care. All right, Alexander. Mm -hmm. Want to answer some questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> all right let's let's finish off the questions and we have another live that we're going to do with on levon on levon's mm -hmm. channel so we'll have to uh get ready for that as well that's going to take place in a couple of hours so let's see here from uh death dealer 1341 do you think that poland and belarus will go to war no i don't think they will go to war i think that um fear of this has probably uh, diminished and there's one overwhelmingly straightforward and very simple reason and that is the failure of ukraine's counteroffensive. i think that has changed completely the whole dynamic of this conflict from this point onwards and i think it's reduced the danger of war right jungle jingle says will multipolarity finally end the white man's burden mindset prevalent in the west or will it double down into hatred as the walls close in that is the single most important question in the world today because multipolarity is going to happen one way or the other we are moving in that direction um the only thing that can prevent it is if we in the west become absolutely you know determined to stick to you know to resist this process and we resist it in a way that leads to some kind of appalling catastrophe. We have to accept, we have to, in our own interests, in the West, recognize that this process is unstoppable. The people in China, people in India, people in Africa, people in Latin America, people in the Middle East, people in Russia, have an equal say and an equal value to us in the West. Very difficult thing for some people in the West to accept, but put aside the idea of white man's burdens and all these terrible imperialist colonial thinking of the past and all sorts of opportunities open. Okay. From OMG Mar Mar Marta, do you expect the Russians and maybe the Chinese to intervene in the US and or, and or Israel really would attack Iran? No, I, I don't think that, you know, I think my own, my own sense is today that we've actually seen a move back from an attack on Iran. Israel is saying that they found no evidence that the Iranians were behind this thing. The United States is saying the same. I think people have looked down the abyss. 
and see what the effect of a attack on Iran might involve. And I think they're pulling back. And of course, if there were to be an attack on Iran, well, um, I mean, you know, the whole thing is would, would just spiral out of control. And um, what the Russians and the Chinese would do in that, in that situation, I'm not sure. But I think initially they would try to bring that fighting to an end, to a stop before it did get even further out of control than it is. But at the moment, I think, as I said, we pulled back from that. Thank God. Thank God for yeah. that. Let's hope that there's yeah. that there's a de-escalation there because yeah. a lot of the neocons are calling for conflict mm. with Iran. Uh, Peter Jackson says, how legitimate is the use of judicial systems and intel agencies to target populist political parties and candidates? Is this the end of the rule of law? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a rhetorical question because, of course, it is the end of the rule of law. The whole point about the rule of law is that it is supposed to be administered impartially. If it is being used to target people for political reasons, then it is no longer impartial and it is not law anymore. It is something completely different. It's, well, I mean, it's the sort of conception of law that, you know, um, uh, Stalin's prosecutor Andrei Vushinsky came up with you know that you you know you don't worry about whether somebody's guilty or innocent in you know the actual crime that they're accused of you only look at the person and their class position and that in is enough in itself to determine questions of guilt or innocence I mean that is not a system I recognize as a legal system in any meaningful sense and I think it's very alarming, incredibly concerning that people in the West are losing sight of that reality. No placeholder holder says, why negotiate? The Anglos are invincible. <laughs> Paul, uh, Paul Walker says, the captors are on video, all speaking Persian, not Arabic. Obama and Biden's cash well spent. And Alensky with his whataboutism was sickening. Well, yeah. Well, I agree with that, actually. I mean, I, I, I haven't seen this video. I don't know that they were speaking Persian, whatever. I mean, clearly, Hamas has received a huge amount of training. They've become very experienced. They know how to do these things. They have a connection with Iran. They have a connection with Hezbollah. I'm not saying that, you know, this has come out. This is just Hamas doing this all by itself, um, you know, without any kind of assistance at all you know, even if that assistance might have been historic. But can I can I say, again, don't deny Hamas itself its own agency. I mean, what I know about Hamas suggests to me that it is an in, incredibly <laughs> tough and, you know, ruthless but calculating organisation. And, of course, it has friends. And it uses them, and it's used them in that way. Now, about the international arms trade, about weapons to Ukraine ending up with Hamas, uh, we're about Hamas getting weapons in that kind of way. Well, what a surprise is all I can say. Of course that has happened. Yeah. I mean, Give I don't know the extent of it, but of course it has. Given the, the fact that the intel warning came from Egypt, what do you make of some sort of, and given it's Hamas, what do you make of of the Muslim Brotherhood and and what role that could play in all, in all of this? They're, they're, they're deeply interconnected with each other. Yeah. I mean, that's my understanding. I'm not an expert on Hamas and its intel. No, I'm not. I'm not. That's why I'm asking you as well. I'm. I'm yeah. I, I just but, find uh, it interesting that yeah. the intel came from Egypt, and exactly. obviously we know the history of the Muslim exactly. Brotherhood in, in Egypt. But, so. but the, the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas have apparently great ideological similarities and remember gaza for a long time was actually governed by egypt until the 1967 six-day war so there was probably a great deal of cross fertilization and i suspect a lot of the ideas that hamas has formed come from that and i am sure that hamas has had contacts still has contacts and connections with the muslim brotherhood which is of course an egyptian organization the Egyptian government is very hostile to the Muslim Brotherhood. They overthrew uh, the president, the Muslim Brotherhood president, President Morsi, and they will be keeping tabs on what was going on between 
the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas and what the Muslim Brotherhood is doing. And, of course, they picked up the intelligence and they passed it on to Israel. I, that, that is what I think happened. And the Israelis didn't listen. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. That, that was what I was thinking as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, I am Valentina says the people who decry the Holocaust now make a Holocaust of their own. Yes. Right. Right. C says, is Israel just another distraction from Ukraine failure or the U S playing their hand to disrupt BRICS from strengthening economics and geopolitical advantages? I, I have to say this. I think if either of those things happen, if it was manipulated and set up in that kind of way, that would be an act of unspeakable cynicism. And, you know, it may be, you know, there are things happening behind the scenes that I don't know about. But as I say, don't deny Hamas its agency. Hamas is a complex, ruthless powerful organization i mean we've just seen this i mean i've had people who are uh, military people and they've been writing to me and they've been saying that the hamas fighters they like special forces you know they had the level of skill that you would expect from special forces soldiers so they i suspect have made their own decisions what's been going on in the background i don't know but i personally skeptical that there's some great wire pullers behind the scenes in Washington or even, dare I say it, in Tehran that have controlled this thing in the way that some people think. And, you know, about it being a distraction from Ukraine. I don't think, for example, that Biden himself was looking for a crisis in the Middle East to distract from Ukraine in that kind of way. I mean, for him, he's got already enough problems. He's now got another one on top of all of those. So, I, you know, I, I, I just say, let's wait and see. Let's get more information. Let's find out what's going on. And at the main, meantime, let's focus on the most important thing, which is preventing this thing from internationalizing and spreading, metastasizing, if you like, across the entire Middle East, which would be a global catastrophe. Jeffrey Belfort, thank you for that super sticker. Will Phillips says, did you all know that Ram Emanuel's dad was a terrorist in the Urgun? The truth is that Hamas did not start a war because the status quo is a war against the dignity and health of Gazans. Le, le, le I, I didn't know about I didn't know about uh, uh, Emmanuel's father being in the well, Urgun. And can I say, I mean, I mean, that's. He, Something I wasn't aware of. Ne ne never, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, well, you were just talking about Biden, but uh, you know he doesn't need another problem. But uh, mm. they will try to figure out how to oh, manipulate yeah. this crisis to oh, their absolutely. benefit. Well, that, that 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 goes without saying. But you know, don't don't at the center overestimate the intelligence of these people. I mean, they're they're pretty blundering as well. So I mean, they will try and exploit it. They're already trying, we've already tried, as we've seen, to enlarge it into an attack on Iran. Some people are now pushing back hard on that. We will see, we will, we will see how this goes. But going back to that question, I mean, at so many levels, at a deep, profound level, you are absolutely right. This is a conflict that goes all the way back to the 1920s. In fact, I, I'd say it goes back even further. If I have to say, who are I'm sorry to say this as a person from Britain, who are the people who bear the foundational blame for this whole business? It was the British who came into the Middle East in the during the period of the First World War and even before, promised the same territory to two people. They said to the Arabs at the time of the Arab revolt against the Ottomans, you know, you can have your independence, you can have your state, support us against the Ottomans, and we will give you what we wanted. That was what Lawrence of Arabia, British Asian, by the way, that was what he was all about. And at the same time, they had, with the Balfour Declaration, they were promising uh, a, a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine, because they also wanted the support of the Jewish people at that time in the conflict against the Germans. So the British have created this disastrous problem in the Middle East. And the 
Palestinians have been its great principal victims. I mean, I think that has to be said. They have been dispossessed. They've been driven. Many of them have been driven out of their lands. Others are living in conditions of occupation. Conditions in Gaza have been terrible. But actually, what has to be done, the thing that has to be done is there has to be a genuine diplomatic solution, a, a, a negotiation to find a solution to this problem. It can be done, provided people decide to do it. And there's been, as Professor Sachs was saying earlier in this program, a fundamental lack of goodwill, a lack of real genuine interest in finding that solution. Because whatever has happened, whatever proposal has been made up to this time from the United States, from Britain before, from Israeli governments, has not sought a solution that really addresses Palestinian grievances and Palestinian aspirations. And that's why we've ended up with a catastrophe that we have. NM2 says in 2005, Israel withdrew from. Gaza, it was a trial run for a larger agreement. Gaza was taken over by Hamas and started firing rockets. How can there be a peace with entities that refuse to recognize Israel's right to exist? But you see, you, you, you've identified the, the underlying problem, which is that, yes, it was supposed to be a trial run leading up to a wider peace. But that wider peace has never happened. And there were attempts from various people to try to do it. You know, Arafat, deeply flawed, corrupt, incompetent man that he was, he made some kind of attempts there. There have been attempts by other people, but ultimately there's never been a sustained real effort to achieve peace in this region. And the result is that, yes, the Israelis withdrew from Gaza, but Gaza was left to decay and decline and the economic conditions there have been terrible, and they've been steadily getting worse. And without a solution or a prospect of solution or a negotiation, inevitably forces like Hamas have emerged and have taken control. Uh, Lurka Perka says, Qatar supported Hamas for years, yet the media blames Iran. What are the odds of the US transferring nukes to Saudis on pretense of democracy. Well, indeed, I mean, I think this is, uh, 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 well, first of all, about Qatar supporting the Hamas, that is absolutely correct. I should say that there has been a historic rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, a fact which many people are not aware of. At times, they have been quite hostile to each other. The Saudi government has historically been hostile to the Muslim Brotherhood and its various branches, of which, in a kind of a way, Hamas is one. And Qatar, by contrast, has tended to support them, despite Qatar being itself also a, well, um, you know, having an idea, the, the royal family there has um, ideologies uh, um, and a, a perspective on religious matters, not that very different from that of the Saudis. What I understand they don't like being called Wahhabis, but anyway, we know that that's what essentially they are. Now, um, so I mean, you, you, you're absolutely you're absolutely correct about that point. From Benzo Beans, see you all on Levan Gudadze's channel at two p.m. London time. Thanks to you for agreeing to be on Levan's first interview guests. I, I understand. Is it 2 p.m. London? I, I was going to say, I think it's 3 p.m. <laughs> 3 p.m. <laughs> London. Yeah, I but, hope so. <laughs> uh, anyway, we'll yeah. be there. Uh, let's hope we got the time right. Um, yeah. Let's see. Jungle Jingle says, Israel's security minister statement about Gaza sounded exactly what Goebbels would have said about the Warsaw ghetto despicable rhetoric. It was absolutely appalling. Was and can I just say, I mean, you know, I... Decisions made in anger are, 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 as I said, regretted at leisure. That's the first thing to say. Going into Gaza in the in that kind of way, trying to sort of fight in Gaza, I would not personally be surprised if that is exactly the scenario that Hamas is trying to provoke. 
that is the first thing. But the alternative, which is turning the entire city into ruins, is would be a terrible war crime. And it would be worse than a war crime. It would be it would be a, a, a monstrous thing to do, terrible thing to do. And people should be pushing back against it. They should be telling the Israeli government, for heaven's sake, don't do this thing. It's not in your interests. Carrying out this kind of monstrous act is not just ethically wrong. It is also politically wrong as well. And that is a point that really needs to be said. Going back to what Professor Sachs was saying, when he was saying that violence begets violence and you're involved in some kind of a cycle. He's absolutely right. If you start turning a whole city of three and a half million people into a ruin and create a humanitarian catastrophe there, as night follows day, people will not remember in the Middle East what Hamas did. Terrible though some of these awful pictures that of what Hamas has done uh, are. They won't remember that. They will remember instead what was done to, Ga to Gaza. And that will simply reinforce the cycle that we have seen. From uh, Liliana, thank you to Jeffrey Sachs and both of you, Alex's. Bless you. Thank you for that. And from BFTE Eyes Wide, assuming that Hamas Israel conflict is an inside job, would you think it's a face saving false flag for Biden and co? If Israel will claim the win in the next few days or weeks, then to me, it is. Also, if Iran continues to be sidelined, then it is another proof to me that it's a false flag. Unfortunately, again, people are dying. Yeah, of course. Well, of course. I mean, I, I, I mean that's absolutely right. But can I just make a few quick observations? If this is that kind of operation, then more likely than not, it is going to fail catastrophically. If it is an attempt to try and create a crisis, you know, letting Hamas fighters burst into Israel in that kind of way, create this kind of situation, have the Israeli army go into Gaza. Um, the likelihood is this is not going to achieve that kind of victory. As I said, it will be an act of unspeakable cynicism to do such a thing. And it would be also an act of unspeakable stupidity <laughs> because you won't, you might find that you're involved in something you cannot control. So if, if these people really are thinking like that and they've organized it in that kind of way, then as I said, they are not just wicked people, which goes without saying, they're also fools. Yeah. Manzo Bean says, see you all on the Van Gudadjie's channel at 3 p.m. London okay. time. All right. Thank you for that, Benzo Beans. Um, Paul Walker says the jaws are closing on Avdivka. Yeah, they are. Uh, uh, that is an important thing. And uh, that, it, this goes takes us back to the battle in Ukraine. The war there hasn't finished. Russians are now advancing in every place. But the big news is Avdivka, not Kupiansk at all, it seems. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin crypto and gaming news says is Sax Khan just joined. Yes. Um, also, <laughs> yes, he has. You can you can follow what yeah. we said. You follow. Uh, he also says Sax is one of my favorite geopolitical commentators. I guess I can catch I, the you... post stream. Yeah. Yes, and Bitcoin crypto and game says it's crazy that Hamas invading Israel ended the Ukraine war. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of yeah. way is kind and of, is uh, Taiwan. And is Taiwan back on the table? Yes, I mean, I don't think Ta I don't think the Taiwan issue has gone away at all. Actually, if you really want to, if you're really looking for the distraction from Ukraine, focus on Taiwan. I think that is where the real big uh, uh, American strike will come. I mean, yeah. the Americans have been talking. American officials, American military people have been talking about a conflict, a war over China. Sometimes since they've been talking about a war with Iran. Yes. Black Tie, thank you for that super sticker. Marcelo says, who controls the money controls the world, but money isn't paper. <laughs> That's true enough. 
H.J. Wang says, I have traveled to Xinjiang. I learned that everything the West said about Xinjiang, the slaves, the abuse, concentration camps were actually all in Gaza, Palestine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Peter Van de Jag, thank you for becoming a Duran member. Jim McGillan says, thank you for what you three do every day. Thank you for that. R.I. says, some pro-Russian people are very opposed to Hamas and a lot of woke activists and celebrities are anti-Israel, but also anti-Russia. It shows you how difficult and complex this conflict is. Oh, absolutely. Can I just say, I mean, you know, one, the, 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 these are different conflicts. I mean, the, the thread that unites them is, and I get to say this, the policies of the United States. I mean, the United States is involved in the conflict in Ukraine, and it is involved in the conflict in the Middle East. But of course, in a, there are, they are also different conflicts. And it's important to stress that Russia, the Putin government, has sought good relations with Israel. It supports Palestinian aspirations. It supports a two-state solution. But it has never looked to quarrel with Israel. Yeah. Uh, Cobb fan says the creation of a Zionist state by the West has resulted in a horror story. Israel being... Frankenstein and Hamas being Frankenstein's monster. monster. Well, well, that's a very uh, insightful comment. <laughs> Jose Silva says, what do you guys think was the biggest mistake in the Ukraine crisis? Not the biggest mistake in the Ukraine crisis. <laughs> Where to begin? Uh, the biggest mistake in the Ukraine crisis was made by the West, which but sought to pull Ukraine away from Russia. And that destroyed Ukraine. That didn't destroy Ukraine because Russia resisted it. It destroyed Ukraine because it upset the demographic and political balance in Ukraine itself. If Ukraine had been left alone, if it understood that Ukraine and Russia were deeply interconnected with each other, then Ukraine would have had a chance. But when it was made into the subject of a tug of war, that was guaranteed that the Ukraine we know would be destroyed. Yeah. Stan, uh, thank you for that super chat. Elsa says, gentlemen, will Ukraine return as the main topic in politics? It looks like it was turned off overnight. And who will pay Alensky? Well, I think, it will I think it will return. <laughs> it is the main topic in politics because at some point, over the next two years that the war is going to end and it's going to end with a Russian victory and that will be very, very difficult for the West. So unless they, you know, unless there's a crisis in China or an even bigger crisis in the Middle East, and can I say again, nobody should want a crisis in the Middle East. I mean, the, 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 the implications, the dangers of that are, are, are terrible. If there are people in Washington who want to, who are deliberately pouring fuel on the flames in the Middle East to distract from Ukraine, then those people are crazy. That's all I would say about this. Yeah. Ted says, can we assume that the discontent in Israel regarding legal reforms, the control of the judici judicial system by Netanyahu, the near mutiny of the Air Force is now suspended and the golden youth and liberal class will rally to Netanyahu, the great war leader? Well, it might, that might very well be the case. I mean, uh, I, I should say we've done a very interesting program, Glenn Deason and I, with um, um, Alistair Crook, who knows this region very well. I mean, he knows the Israelis extremely well. He knows the Palestinians extremely well. And he has some very interesting and insightful comments to make about that. He, by the way, thinks that this event that we've just seen is to a great extent a product of the internal conflict within Israel, <laughs> that it both served as the trigger for it and also the opportunity for it that Hamas saw. Uh, Ans Human Mishra says, can the conflict in Israel damage BRICS expansion? Potentially, yes, if the war expands. I mean, if the war is not contained, then it could affect BRICS expansion. And um, the Russians and the Chinese are aware of that. The Russians certainly are. And we know that the Russians, uh, their various embassies, their diplomacy is now working very, very hard to try to contain this crisis. So, by the way, those that the, there is now already a subculture of people in London, especially, who are saying that this is 
Putin who started this whole thing. I discussed this in my program yesterday. Um, I mean, that could not be more wrong. The Russians are very concerned, very alarmed by these developments, and they want to try and cool things down and to defuse the situation because they see it as dangerous to themselves. Uh, Ilsec6, welcome to the Duran community. Sparky says, sorry, got here late. Isn't it known that Hamas is at least loosely controlled opposition for the West? Can, can, can you just say, repeat that? It, isn't it, oh, yeah. isn't it uh, known that Hamas is at least loosely controlled opposition for the West? I, I think that there is a grain of truth in that, in terms of Hamas's origi origins, in the sense that, um, and, and, and this isn't, by the way, controversial, what I'm going to say, which is in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, there was a certain policy that was pursued by the Western powers and indeed by Israel as well, which was to support religious movements in the Middle East and in places like Afghanistan in order to defeat the secular nationalist, rather left-wing movements like the PLO, for example, that were aligning with the Soviet Union. And the idea was that these religious movements like Hamas were conservative, they were strongly anti-communist, that would enable um, Soviet influence to be counted across the Middle East, and that these groups would be easier to control. And of course, that policy has failed catastrophically, but it did exist. And it was, by the way, pursued by Israel itself. There was a time, I think this is generally accepted, when Israel actually quietly supported Hamas because it wanted to see the PLO lose support within the Palestinian territories. Now, I don't think that those connections on the part of Hamas really exist anymore. I think that Hamas is... Um, allegiances, its friendships now, are more with countries like Iran and with organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt than they are with the West any longer. Um, I, I, I mean, that's my own clear view about this. Sorry, I, I can't hear you, Alex. Um, Sorry, I no, had it. No, I can't. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Elena Diaz says, why nobody talks about Marx's idea that socialism can only happen after capitalism became global. Um, Lenin had other ideas that thought socialism could come gradually, but we are living Marx's idea. <laughs> you may be right. I mean, I, I, I mean, what my, I, I used to read lots of Marx, by the way. I, mean, I must say, I, I, interesting. Really, it's a very interesting read, and he did have many insightful things to say. But um, I, you know, I, I'm not going to get into that particular discussion. I mean, of course, Lenin always thought saw himself as a completely conventional, orthodox Marxist. His view very much was that. Um, revolution was a process that happened um, and that it should not be restrained. On the contrary, it should be expedited wherever possible because that would create a deeper crisis in capitalism. And of course, his view was that by the late 19th century, capitalism had already become global. And he even wrote a famous, perhaps in some ways his best uh, piece, which is about the spread of capitalism in Russia, which he actually wrote, I believe, sometime in the 1890s. Adam G says, good point, Alexander. Regarding no diplomacy, people like Grey Zone, who generally I trust seem to have blinders on against Israel, negotiated settlement is what the pundit narrative needs to be instead of just saying free Palestine. Well, indeed, yes. I mean, how is Palestine going to be freed without a negotiation? without some kind of a settlement. I mean, it's impossible for me to see that. I mean, quite apart, again, from the absolutely critically important humanitarian considerations. I mean, you know, seeking victory 
conclusive victory by one side or the other is going to take you both to a very dark place, it seems to me. The other thing is, in terms of Israel, we're talking about a nuclear power, which is one of the most powerful military states in the Middle East and which is anchored in the Western system. You can't just push it aside. I mean, it'd be wrong to try to do that, I think given, as I said, the humanitarian consequences of that. But I don't think it's doable, given which there has to be a negotiated solution. That is in the Palestinians' interests. It's in the Israelis' interests too. Even if some people in Israel don't want to see that. Jose Silva says, I understand we live in dangerous times, but I get a little excitement from whispering from witnessing history in the making love both your work yeah, indeed Thank absolutely <laughs> why do we do our program yeah. i mean of course uh, it's exciting it's also exhausting by the way and you know sometimes it can be uh, deeply troubling and harrowing and all of those things but i mean i i first studied my first degree was in history i've never lost a love of history and as you rightly say we are seeing history in the making rl says in this world the enemy of your enemy is not necessarily your friend look what happened after america supported afghan fighters against the soviet union it can backfire very brutally like a puppy absolutely. playing with a cobra absolutely can i just say i think one of the most pernicious <laughs> conceptions is this one about you know, the enemy the enemy of my enemy is my friend I think that has led to more mistakes, more disasters and more tragedies than almost anything else, any other sort of conception that you will find in international relations. Frank O'Reilly, thank you for that super chat. Ashur Banapal says, the British also promised a homeland to the Assyrians, which they later reneged on. Absolutely. Ashur Banapal, by the way, just for people who don't know, name of several kings of ancient Assyria, including one of the greatest, and a founder of a great library, which was found in Nineveh by the British and bits and bobs of it, are, are in the British Museum, where the British took it. I'm not going to say more about that history, but you're absolutely right. Um, Assyrians, of course, today are Christians. They're a Christian community within Iraq. They still exist. They, their language, by the way, is Aramaic. Their native language is Aramaic, which is the language of Jesus. I've met Assyrians. They've spoken to me in Aramaic. It is very, very moving uh, to meet people of that nature. And what you say is absolutely true. Nicholas Walker says, conflict in Europe with Russia Ukraine, then Middle East with Israel, Palestine. Any chance China is looking at this thinking if there's a chance? Well, I think one day, uh, I think I think one day there is a real possibility because the United States has repeatedly shown that it cannot be an honest uh, mediator in this matter. I think one day the China might step in and fulfill that role. I mean, I really do. I think the Chinese are gradually edging their way into the Middle East. I think they're sufficiently far away and removed from this problem to come to it with a certain degree of objectivity. And I think at the same time, they want a peaceful and stable Middle East. I think, by the way, if there were a sustained attempt to find a resolution to this problem, my own view is, contrary to what most people think, I think it can be found. I do not think this problem is insoluble. I think there is a fundamental misconception. And I think it can be found, and I think it can be found in a sustainable way. And maybe one day it will be the Chinese who will find it. Jose Silva says, Hamas and other countries should be careful by the appearance of a weakening US power because it might not be that they're weakening. It's just that others are growing more powerful in comparison. This is also very true. And can I say again, one of the reasons for this explosion, in my opinion, is because there's been a general perception within the Middle East that American power is getting weaker. 
Now, that's certainly true, I think, on the part of many Arabs and including, I suspect, people in Hamas. But it is also apparently true in Israel, uh, amongst Israel, uh, amongst some people in Israel as well. And again, um, um, see, watch that program with Alistair Crook and see what he has to say about that, because I found that one of the most interesting points that he made over the course of that program. And let me repeat again, this is an area that he knows extremely well. Elena says, if Israel destroys Gaza, they will forfeit a lot of political capital and goodwill they got after World War II. They are taking the full step to perpetrators. Well, I have to say I agree with that. I mean, I, I, I think it would be a, um, a, 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 a colossal and disastrous step. And as I said, as I said before, it would be ethically wrong and it, it profoundly ethically, morally catastrophically wrong and it would be a huge political mistake as well by the way can i just say this what you tend to find i, I you know i speak now as somebody who's familiar with I, i've studied history i've followed international relations very very closely morally wrong steps far more often than not turn out to be politically disastrous as well from atmos gaza is without electricity water gas how can Hamas, how can hamas fight while living under such conditions also does israel even know where the hostages are since they seem to be randomly bombing are they killing their own well i'm going to make a simple observation i think the people who are probably most well supplied and provided for in gaza are hamas its organization and its fighters i mean they've clearly prepared for this they will have stores supplies i'm supposing they've probably borrowed tunnels they got bunkers they got all of those things the people who will suffer most of this will be the civilian population and that's a thing to uh, be extremely concerned about indeed from uh rafael good job guys thank you for that rafael called medano says the paraglider but but that clan was organized by leaders and dutifully carried out by soldiers celebrated by civilians this is a unique moral category well i i do think it's unique but again it does show extraordinary proficiency, extremely careful planning, and people who have been writing to me who know about these things have said that this is up to the quality standard of what special forces do. So, you know, just, just take note of that fact. Z Special says a war with China will shake the world to its core. Many people can't seem to understand what what the will of the Chinese looks like until the entire nation goes to war. This is modern day China, not the China of the 1960s. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. I don't think even the China of the 1960s should be underestimated. I mean, um, Douglas MacArthur said, you know, that it would be an act of incredible folly to get into a land war in Asia. And, you know, he was talking about China specifically, and he was talking in the 1950s. And of course, today, I mean, anybody who seriously plans for and wills a war with China is uh, uh, a dangerous fool. But unfortunately, there are such people. Sam Isam, thank you for joining the Durant community. Raphael says BRICS should get rid of India. They are too weak. I think India what? is not too weak. And I think India is an indispensable part of the BRICS. Right. I think even the Chinese understand that. Uh, Raunak Singh says, do you guys think multipolarity will bring an end to NATO's foreign military bases? Yes, in time. I, 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 I think multipolarity will bring an end to NATO, period. Yeah. It will take Rula time for that to happen, but not very much, very long. I think Rula Ukraine, the Ukraine crisis is already... Um, hastening that day. Brulal OK says the Ukrainians should look at Palestine and think how, th how they could have been in their place if Russia hated them, but they still have a chance. Well, 
can, can I just actually, now that you've brought that up, make a simple point? I mean, you know, we've had the Ukrainians shelling Donetsk. We've seen one attempt by Ukraine after another to pro provoke the Russians into um, extreme steps. And one thing I have to say is that the Russians have responded to this. Putin has responded to this with exceptional self-discipline. And we're starting to see how that is working to their advantage. And both sides, both sides in this conflict in the Middle East need to heed that lesson. I mean, uh, it, anyway, let's let's yeah. move on. <laughs> Go ahead, you were saying? No, what I was going to say, I mean, you know, if you're talking about Hamas, as I said, given the proficiency of this operation, how much more effective might it have been if they just focused on attacking military targets? And on Israel's side, how disastrous it will be if they let themselves be provoked into a long-scale insurgency war in Gaza or do some other appalling horrors there. Discipline right. in war is one of the most important things. Acting with restraint, self-restraint, is often the, the key to victory. La, La Republic European says, why would Hamas attack now? Do they think they have time on their side, like China and Russia? Do they even stand a chance today to gain anything from this? I think that uh, Hamas has timed this very, very carefully at a time when, firstly, they feel that they're ready. I mean, they've obviously, as I said, been preparing this for a very, very long time. They've seen the political conflict that is taking place in Israel. They've noted the attacks on the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the Harim Haram al-Sharif, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And they've, they've timed, and of course, they acted, they, they struck during a Jewish holiday. So I think they've timed this extremely carefully. Liliana Corridor says, Lavrov just said the solution is a two-state with security agreements. Why does Israel block it? Ethnic cleansing? Question mark. Well, why does Israel block it? That's a very good question. I would say, I will tell you why. I, th I will tell you why I think it is. And, you know, I'm sorry if I'm putting the blame here on the United States, but I am. What has happened is that instead of the United States working purposefully towards achieving a two-state solution, they have invariably ended up siding with Israel on every single important issue and supported maximalist positions, which some Israeli leaders have taken. I can remember not so long ago that there was a very strong peace movement in Israel. You don't see that anymore because that peace movement was undercut by the fact that the United States, the US government, always end, seemed to end up, ended up, supporting, as I said, Israeli leaders who took maximalist positions. So the result is that Israel has felt under no real pressure, no real incentive to seek a two-state solution, or if not a two-state solution, at least a solution that responds to the grievances, the aspirations of the Palestinian people. You can come up with other scenarios. I'm not going to discuss them in this program, but there are possible ways that you could find a way to do this, where these two communities could share the land and live alongside each other in peace, each respecting the other. But there has never been any incentive, political incentive, for Israeli leaders to do that, because behind them, they've always felt the power of the United States. And as a result, Israel itself has been lured into pursuing policies, which, in my opinion, are contrary to its long term interests. Orion Watcher says, when are the uh, what are the odds that they want to keep Russia and Iran busy on long conflicts to be able to attack China? knowing it's not going to receive help with many weapons and other things. Well, I think I think there are probably people in Washington, and not just in Washington, of course, in London too, who probably do think it that kind of way. But if that is correct, they are crazy. And let me repeat that, this again. What you're doing is you're starting wars in Ukraine, in the Middle East. You think you're bogging down Iran 
and Russia, and then you can come after China. China, which is, of course, militarily one of the most powerful countries in, in the world, all by itself. What you're actually doing is you're giving all of these countries a commonality of interest to stick with each other. That's, that is one. And the other thing is you are spreading instability across the entire global system. And given that it is the United States more than any other country that is at the core of the global system, you are ultimately destabilizing the position of the United States more than you are China's. So, as I said, I think there are people who think like that. I mean, there was that bizarre Rand Corporation report about Russia, which thought about that. But that kind of thinking is bad and foolish and dangerous, and it is not in the interests of the United States. Lurka Perka says, revolutions happen on economic rise and never on decline. Thank you both, Alex and Alexander, for in-depth analysis and word of reason. Love, Duran. There is a lot of truth in what you say, but I think one shouldn't be too dogmatic about this. Certainly, you're correct. If you're talking about, say, France in the um, late 18th century, contrary to what many people think, the French economy in the run up to the French Revolution was growing and there was a spread of prosperity. If you go to Paris today, for example, most of the buildings that you see, many of the houses that you see there were built in the 18th century under the, you know, the Ancien Regime. And the same is true to some extent in Russia. I mean, there was a long period of economic growth leading up to the uh, you know, period that gave rise to the revolution. Things to say is, firstly, it is how that economic growth is managed. That is the important thing. If equalities, inequalities grow, if people feel left behind, if the governments are not able to match the aspirations of the people, then, of course, dangerous situations can start to grow and fester. And, of course, economic growth and development is not linear. So even in periods of rapid economic growth or sustained economic growth, you can have deep economic crises. That's what happened in France in the 1780s. And that, of course, does act as a trigger for revolution. And, of course, it happened in Russia, too. So it, it's, it, it's a more complex, more nuanced thing than I think you've just said. Paul Walker says, when Gaza morphs into a humanitarian crisis due, due to blockade and destroyed infrastructure, will Arab nations show their support? Will they pivot early? Well, we don't know. I, I think that Arab governments do not want to be drawn into a war. I mean, that's the first thing to say. I don't think Egypt, for example, or Saudi Arabia want to be plunged into a war. But, of course, there is an Arab public opinion. People always say, they always laugh at the fact that the Arab, what's called the Arab street, they say that will never really have any effect. It never um, succeeds in mobilizing um, people across the Middle East. My own personal view is that if the last 30 years have told us anything, it is that that kind of perspective about the Middle East is complacent. Frank says, Iran now knows the Iron Dome is done. <laughs> yeah. Tom, somebody says, until the West drops its unipolar neocon geopolitics, the Middle East crisis created by them over 100 years ago, and longer Russophobia, there'll be no peace. The revised historical narrative needs drastic changing. Yes, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Sparky says, Israelis lined up at the airport to flee. Makes things seem different this time. Yes. Yes. Jetset.1 says, is this another planned war by the West? Well, again, I know a lot of people think this. I've seen nothing that persuades me that that is so. I mean, I, and again, I repeat what I've made. I've said this many times now over the course of this program. Don't assume that Hamas itself doesn't have agency. I believe it does. I think this idea that Hamas is simply a cat's paw for someone else I think it's wrong. I mean, I've been following Hamas for some time. I think this is a, you know, it's it's 
an underestimated organization. Let me put it that way. So that's the first thing to say. But if people in the United States, in Washington and London and Brussels and wherever are really doing this, if they're creating these conflicts on purpose, then as I said, these people have taken lead of their senses. They don't understand what they are doing. And yes, they may try to manipulate them to their advantage. In fact, they unquestionably will, but all they will do is they will get burnt and they will cause many other people to get burnt as well. Red Pill Scholar says, when the world looks at America, what it sees is an Israeli colony, Paul Craig Roberts. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know that is that is his view. I, I have to say, I, I actually don't fully accept that analysis i mean look at israel look at the united states i mean the united states is so much larger so much more powerful so much more complex as society than israel is that i think it's much more likely in some respects that it's the united states that has been running things in israel rather than vice versa i know that's a view <laughs> that a lot of people don't share but it's mine devin says multipolarity will also end the eu guys Yes, mm -hmm. at least in his, yes. Yeah, Certainly Nina Algo. It's evolved into absolutely. Nina Algo says this news channel is superior to any neocon show. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, no placeholder says it's all fake, and three point five million people are the victims. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Raphael says Russia still suffers inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis the USA. Iran is not having this problem. They will fight. In a New York minute, Iran is not scared like R. Do you know something? Um, I think that was already beginning to change in the last 10 years in Russia. But I think this conflict in Ukraine has massively accelerated that change. I think the Russians have suddenly discovered that they can not only live without the United States, but that they can defy it successfully. And of course, at the conclusion of this conflict in Ukraine, that perception will have gone entirely. Lada Moreau says Israel took Palestine's land and replaced her citizens. Israel has to at least pay contributions and reparations to Palestinians, not killing them. I think you have again put your finger on a, on, on a fundamental issue, which is that Israel, the West, needs to understand that the Palestinians have legitimate a legitimate and very powerful grievance caused by the way in which their nationhood their statehood and much, and their land was taken from them after the first world war and um you know and this is something that until it is addressed and addressed properly i don't mean you know coming up with you know silly solutions like you know saying you know these people can this village can have water rights and this doesn't which is some of the things which previous negotiations have got bogged down into a proper understanding that this thing has to be resolved in that kind of way then there cannot be peace in that region i repeat my view i think that this problem can be solved i think there is a desire on both sides to solve it the problem is that there is no will to do so from those political forces, the political class, which really has a duty to solve it, to work towards solving it. And that's the problem. Elena says, have you seen all the attacks on Christians and lethal threats from Israelis? Many such videos. Absolutely. And, and, and they are appalling. And I come back to this simply because, you know, um, there are genuine Palestinian grievances. Some of these pictures that we have seen should not be relativized or excused. They're appalling. And I come back to my earlier point. In my experience and in, from my historical knowledge, carrying out actions like this is not only deeply, morally, ethically, humanly wrong, it is also politically wrong also. It does not advance the course of redressing 
what has been done to the Palestinians. On the contrary, it 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 pushes it back. Theron says Palestinians have tried all peaceful options without any success. When peaceful options are ignored for decades, violence will ensue. Free yes, Palestine. I agree with that. I you know and and but again understand where that failure comes from it comes from the political class in israel certainly in the west generally in the united states in my opinion most of all the united states had multiple opportunities to forge peace it could have acted as a genuine honest broker and it chose not to and contrary to what many people think i think in most cases that was a deliberate choice Jerry, thank you for that super sticker. Red Z says, hard to be a humanist. I want Fortress America. And Sparky says, despite being warned by Egypt, Bibi likely let the Hamas attack happen to distract from his troubles, not realizing the ultimate scope and depth of it. Well, if that is correct, and you may be right, I mean, I again, I, I wonder, but if you're right about that, then all I can say is that it's very, very important that he go. Because a prime minister of a country who invites an attack on his country in order to resolve his own political problems is certainly a leader that, well, he's not he's not a proper leader of his country anymore. He's, um, I mean, he's to say straightforwardly a criminal. Uh, and, and that's how um, Bibi should be looked at if this is what he did i haven't seen the compelling evidence that that was the case i appreciate that the egyptians were giving these warnings my own view is that the israelis were so completely caught up in their own internal problems and i think they'd become so complacent for so long because they were probably receiving warnings like this in the past and nothing happened that this time they didn't pay attention. And, well, that led to this. But, you know, if you're right, if BB did this in, on purpose, then, I mean, frankly, he deserves, he deserves prison. Russell Hall says certain evangelical factions may support conflict in the Middle East and in Israel specifically as a way of helping along eschatological prophecy. I came across people like that when I was at university, and um, um, I remember being absolutely stunned that they even existed. You're absolutely right. I mean, people who think that this is the way to bring on the, and they want to bring it on, the end of all days, <laughs> um, fundamentally um, flawed theologically, I might add, in terms of both Christian and Jewish belief, uh, those people do exist. How influential they are, I really am not able to say. Okay, Alexander, that is everything. No. All right, guys, let's end. Uh, let's end this live stream because we have another live stream to, Absolutely. Uh, to get to. Uh, thank you to everybody that uh, that was watching us on this program. Thank you to the great Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you to Alexander McCurry. Thank you to our moderators. Uh, Valies, Alan Watson, and um, who else was moderating? Uh, I think I think that's it. Alan Watson and Valies, thank you so very much to everyone that watched us on Locals, our amazing Locals community, the Duran.locals.com, and Rockfin, Odyssey, Rumble, YouTube. Take care, everybody.